Okay, on and upwards we go. We are going to hear from um, a very important person now. It is our platinum sponsor, Julian Critchlow, the general manager of ANZ for Extreme Networks. Please put your hands together for Julian. Thank you for the introduction. I hope you can all hear me okay. Is that a, a thumbs up or a wave of the arms? Thank you. Um, and, and thank you for being introduced in such a favorable light. Um, I think this is my fourth time uh, presenting to uh, the luminaries and visitors and the really important people at Questnet over my time in Australia, stretching back to 2011. Um, my first time presenting in this fashion, though, and um, it's great that you all can be there. Um, I'm incredibly happy for you all, but I've got a significant tinge of disappointment that I can't be there. Um, I'm Sydney-based and would have loved the chance to come and present to you today in person. Um, we'll look to see if we can make that happen at, at the next quest now. Um, on that note, you know, I, I think we all thought we saw light at the end of the tunnel and the, the recent you know, developments with what's going on with our, our real lives. Let's hope that uh, that light is not another train coming to hit us. So um, hopefully we can start doing more of these events in face-to-face -face and um, Myself and, and the wider team at Extreme Networks can make that journey over to, um, to the Sunshine State and come and see you um, face to face. So I uh, really appreciate that. that. <clears throat> so um, just wanted to spend a few moments just again, you know, thank you to, um, I think a big thanks to Queensland University of Technology for um, working with the conference organizers to put this on uh, at very short notice to, um, to make this happen. Um, and, you know, thank you for everyone that's taken the time to, you know, participate in this. Um, it, obviously, the challenges are of keeping this, you know, fairly informal and a two-way flow of information are difficult, um, but we'll try and do the best we can over the uh, coming 50 or so minutes as I go through a, a little bit of slide where, but try to keep it light and, and try to keep it informative, and we'll try and keep a, a dialogue going as best we can. Um, start our presentation with a typical disclaimer, which I'm sure you've had the time to read through whilst I've been um, covering off those few points of housekeeping. Um, and look, I just wanted to, I guess, from where we sit as Extreme Networks, look at uh, a little bit of evolution. Um, and I, it's a theme that will come through the, the presentation as we go through about, you know, the evolving landscape of we see it. And typically, from a vendor point of view, we've always looked at these things in very, very dry technical numbers. And, and look, this slide is no different. And I think we're all very, very comfortable with the evolving landscape, you know, the, the proliferation of devices, um, the amount of data that we are creating, the mobility of our users, and what that also means from what we're trying to do. And, I, you know, it was very, very interesting to note around the ransomware attack that was called out at the beginning of this presentation. So if we look at where we see resources and endeavor going, both from, you know, vendors like ourselves and the the R&D we place in our technology, but also um, your own endeavor where you spend your budgets and uh, align your resources from staffing. Um, security is always top of mind. And I think that is going um, to, nothing is going to stop that from moving forward. And it will always be top of mind for the foreseeable long-term future. Um, we look at some of the other challenges we see out there. Um, you know, how many of us have more staff than we had previously? Um, I hold, uh, um, you know, a background of working in the internal IT department for some of the more older folks in the room. I used to work at a company called Cabletron Systems from the, the 1990s um, in their internal IT department. And we had 24 staff, um, you know, by the mid 2000s, that was down to about six. And I think we've all been through that sort of attrition. So it's interesting to note those challenges, that landscape, but a, a couple of the evolutionary points in that. Um, which I've put on the slide where, which is um, what we're doing when it comes to organizing, orchestrating, and managing our network infrastructure, uh, particularly as it pertains to what's going on with cloud. Um, and what we see with that is, you know, 50% of organizations, as they go through their migrations to moving other technologies and other parts of the stack to the cloud, what remit and what um, use cases are there for cloud managed networking across larger campus environments? And every piece of information we see says that 50% of people are looking at that now. 
And by 2023, it will be the number one way that organizations actually look to manage and orchestrate and secure their campus environments. And over the course of the presentation, we'll just pull that apart a little bit and you know, perhaps a little bit of food for thought of, of why and some of the benefits potentially it can bring to organizations such as the ones you represent. So just a little bit about Extreme for those the people that don't know. Um, we're a technology vendor, um, been in this industry for some um, 20 plus 25 years, I think we celebrated this year. So um, we've been at the forefront of you know things like the dot-com boom. Um, we were the first company to introduce gigabit ethernet switching for the people that likes that sort of thing. Uh, also the first company to do 10 gigabit ethernet switching. Um, but as we've matured as a company over time um, to our current scale of you know, just shy of 3,000 employees um, and a global presence across 80 countries, we've taken what we do much more seriously than you know the, the feed and the speed, the blue wire, uh, and how fast we can move packets. Um, what we've been looking at very recently in our portfolio is how we drive um, a lot more value around what we're doing and what we can see with the cloud platforms. Um, and we've been relatively successful in that. In fact, um, Omdia called us and as out as being the fastest growing vendor when it came to cloud management for um, 2020. Um, but that's all very well and good, but really what I'm here to do and what um, we as a company extol is who we serve. And so we are an incredibly customer centric and laser focused on driving outcomes for our customer base. Um, which there are currently around 50,000 um, customers globally, which uh, interesting to note, higher education is our strongest vertical that we service across the globe. So from you know, local uh, institutions using our technology to you know, universities all across the globe, it is what we as a company do best. So moving on to past that, I'm looking at the challenges we currently see um, in the marketplace and the challenges we see in organizations around a little bit of history of how we've got to this point. And um, we still see in our infrastructure, our switchers, routers particular, and particularly at the scale of campus environments that you know manifest themselves in higher education, this challenge of architecture, protocol, and topology. Um, we find we have a history um, going past plus 25 years of how we've designed, built and run um, typical campus environments. And we find a lot of the technology and a lot of the protocol and a lot of the know-how back from them is still very, very fundamental in how we build networks, which is, I guess, good from some points. We have an understanding of those protocol, but it is bad from other aspects that there are lots of protocols we now have to deal with. And when we look at the transformations that are going on in our organizations and technologies specifically, I've seen and heard from many higher education customers uh, in Australia and New Zealand, and from my contemporaries across the globe, technologies like audio video uh, is really causing us pain in how we've been architecting infrastructure. And then we start wrapping in other challenges. Um, I think it's fair to say that there has been a groundswell of movement that we need to redress this approach we have um, to architecture, protocol, and topology. And we'll come back to that as we go through the presentation. Um, we also have seen over the last four or five years, I guess, some challenges in network management. And, you know, I, my history goes back to, I say, working with Cabletron Systems and the world's first network management piece of software um, called Spectrum um, that originated back from 1993. And I look at that platform and I look at what broadly what we're doing today, and there isn't really that too much different. Um, we've added new things on. So if we look at our campus environment, we've got you know, our switching, our Wi-Fi, our routing, maybe some ancillary devices that we choose to manage um, by the same tool set. And we are striving towards you know, creating you know, the, the much vaunted and often discussed single pane of glass. And we look at that from, okay, we can manage our network infrastructure through that through typical protocols that have stood the test of time, um, you know, SNMP uh, and so on. Um, we started looking at driving more value out of that network management platform. We started looking at technologies like network access control. Can I bring that into a single pane of glass? It's pertinent to my network. My single pane of glass is managing my infrastructure across um, the campus holistically. 
can I start bringing in who the users are on my network? Can I identify everyone at the edge of my infrastructure and bring those two pieces of information together so I can drive some value from that? And I think you know, my first ever presentation at Questnet in 2011 was extolling the value of everyone deploying a NAC solution. Um, that went down very nicely in that um, event, the fact that no one ever seemed to want to go and do it. But I think as we've matured organizationally, I think most people have some kind of access control system now, and it's feeding very nicely into a single pane of glass. Um, about three or four years ago, network vendors started going, okay, I'm beginning to be able to build a data set a lake of information from the infrastructure and the, the technology I've deployed on campuses. How do I start driving, you know, some top line value from that, which is, you know, how can I analyze what the infrastructure is doing and perhaps add more visibility, perhaps a bit of um, value to other lines of business within an organization. Uh, perhaps I can start trying to track what users are doing on an infrastructure. And it'd be nice to throw that in the single pen of glass because they're all pertinent together, tied together. And I guess that's what drove us to the, a couple of things that started damaging and breaking our single pens of glass. Um, and again, I'll, I'll drive back to the fact that security is top of mind for everyone. Um, we started looking at security as not being something that was adjacent to our campus infrastructure. It was something fundamentally at the core of our network infrastructure. Security had to be a key part of that. Um, and that was the first major challenge that we started having as we start trying to look at this from a holistic level of how we'd manage um, everything end to end, but we could still kind of cope. But there's two transformational um, technologies coming down the line that really, um, as they mature, are really going to, you know, fundamentally have to alter how we look at network management and specifically the on-premise approach to it. And, you know, those two um, you know, buckets, if we just draw them into the slide deck, are um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. And I know they're overused terms and trough of disillusionment and all those things. But it is, you know, my fervent belief, and I think everyone in the industry, that those two things will add value to everyone. It's just, can we set up our organizations to drive to that value? And that's one of the key challenges that potentially technologies and what we can do at scale in the cloud start unlocking, unlocking that potential for us. And lastly, IoT. Um, if we start trying to manage IoT in typical fashion, we are going to start breaking our scaling very, very quickly. So if we take a look at that and start looking at it from, from those um, challenges of the on-premise approach with versioning, um, troubleshooting, um, the sprawl of software stack to um, drive that, and the fact just how difficult it is to try and drive towards anything like AI and ML um, on an on-premise solution, the cost that would drive and the complexity, we can start seeing that adding all those things up, potentially looking at something from the cloud starts to add a lot of value. And we will start looking at what we can do out of the cloud, you know, AI and ML, um, behavioral analysis, intent-based networking, all things that the infrastructure from its lake of data that it's creating can actually drive value to, you know, the network infrastructure team, but also to adjacent parts of any organization, security being, being a key one. And I guess the question we ask ourselves as we go to market and design and, and build these solutions, and we ask, you know, our customers, have we reached a tipping point where we need to start looking at a different way? And looking, um, there's a, a rather pithy phrase we have locally, you know, perhaps our single pane of glass is very much becoming a single glass of pain. And just wrapping that up um, with a half an eye back to our, our um, adjacent technologies and security, you know, I've been, you know, very, very impressed with you know, everything I've seen around zero trust as an architecture, as a model, how we can, you know, look at that, take its learnings, look at its tenants and drive that value of more security into our organization. You know, the concepts of least privilege has been around for a heck of a long time, you know, doing a CIS SSP back in the day, lots of it was driven around this concept of least privilege. Um, Device-based access control, again, something we all know we should be doing. Micro segmentation is another key thing that, that ZTA and what it's looking to do is asking us to restructure how we build things. 
um, mainly to present the, to prevent the unauthorized lateral movement of you know data users devices across our infrastructure and the creation of policy enforcement points all very very sensible things that I think most organizations are looking at however throwing it back into the harsh reality of where we are with nerd by nerd systems which most of our infrastructure falls into um, they are very very difficult challenges to do um, if we then start layering on complexity that we have multiple protocols running across those node by node systems, the multiple protocols themselves have their own attack surfaces and attack uh, vectors that can be exploited. Um, it creates more of a challenge for us. And by the way, config on is very, very heavy on a node by node. Who wants to go and you know um, completely redesign and, and push new ACLs across an entire campus infrastructure? That is not an easy thing to do without significant change management and significant uh, endeavor and resource to achieve. And look, and I don't think we can go past it. We look at the challenge of our time. Well, I hope it's the challenge of our time and it's not gonna go any worse, um, but we look at what COVID has done to all our businesses. Um, the fact that, you know, uh, I know it's an incredibly tough time in higher education because of what, what COVID has done for us all. Um, it is incredibly difficult that we are having to you know, reorganize and restructure how, you know, higher education is, as organizations add value back to your own customers. And, you know, those sorts of things, you know, hopefully we can get back to some level of normality. Um, but with, you know, the recent news of Omicron, where does that leave us? Um, how do we fold that into anything that's going around with our infrastructure, our spend, where do we put our resources? when we live in such uncertain times um, based upon um, the pandemic that we find ourselves in. So let's take a look at a step back at that and start look, hang on, what's the opportunity here? There's challenges, yes, and we've been facing challenges forever. So what's the opportunity? And I always look at this and what I'm beginning to see in the market is for the first time in a long time, we truly need to do something. Um, you know, necessity being the mother invention. I think the, the phrase, I think is originally from Plato or, or some such luminary. Um, but for the first time, we truly need to do something different. Um, we know we need new topologies. Um, why do we, we know that? Because we, we keep creating new ones, um, but we somehow seem to fail to follow through on their, their promise and the status quo kicks in. Um, we know there's new overlay and underlay protocols that can really drive value for our organizations, make things a heck of a lot more simpler, um, deliver solutions like AV and, and other multicast based solutions much more effectively across our infrastructure. We know we need better security. Um, we've got to really start looking at those tenants of ZTA and, and pushing them through. Network access control and micro segmentation. These things, we know we've got to do them. Um, we're in this position where I believe and I hope um, we can actually get to do it, that the need drives the requirement and we start looking at these um, solutions afresh. We know we need a new better um, management paradigm. Um, you know, we look at this from what's happened with our users, um, you know, given where we are right now, who knows where our users, our data at rest is, and, you know, when it's in transit, how it's secured. These are challenges that are going to be, you know, long term as we restructure our organizations around our current situation and look uh, what we see at extreme is terming this phrase called the infinite enterprise where we look at experiences as being much more consumer centric and that's not consumer is in the home user it's much more how do we make the technology consumable at a term and a pace that suits your organization and this transformation that it has to go through we know that from an organizational point of view, you will be more distributed than you have ever been before. Um, if we ever get back to the previous levels of how we were much more confined to physicality, you know, room building campus, um, who knows? But we do know that we in the COVID pandemic have been able to distribute our organizations and our enterprises much more globally at scale. And we achieved that scale through the use of cloud, be it from whatever applications we've been using, the easiest way to scope out and scale up all the challenges was to look at cloud-based technologies. 
So if we look at the opportunities, so what does cloud-based management give us as the opportunity? I think we all know the trend and I won't dwell too long on this slide, but we know where we are with our cloud migration strategies. We know how mature those platforms are. We know about the availability. Um, I think data sovereignty is now being ticked as a box that we all can look at. And I'm not saying that the economics of cloud are correct. I'm saying that the economics of cloud, we all truly understand now. Um, and there is no shock in moving things to the cloud. Um, we understand what it's going to do both from our CapEx and our operational budgets. Um, we've got the maturity in market to understand that. Um, the market acceptability is completely there. The, the concept of migrating risk to the supply side, um, given their expertise in the availability, in data recovery, especially when you um, say terms around ransomware, um, having that data somewhere with SLAs guaranteeing its recovery is a nice comfort blanket, right? Instead of relying purely on in-house solutions, you understand why the risk mitigation of cloud sometimes is the most significant um, benefit. And look, let's call it out, as technology vendors, we see a, um, a divesting away from infrastructure. Um, we see that infrastructure being placed more and more in cloud. And lastly, um, just from this very, very high level overview, um, innovation, every single IT innovation we see typically has a very much a, a cloud first um, like leaning towards it. Um, that is what happens when you know the market and marketing get behind that and want to start driving value for organizations. That's what drives the innovation. And I think we'll see that accelerating as well. So, if we look at cloud consumption models um, and we look at our good friend, the single pane of glass with on-premise, um, we see this transformation moving rapidly across all our, all our industries. Um, the mood from perpetual licensing to subscriptions. Um, I always joke, you know, five years ago, I only had one subscription and that was Foxtel. Um, and that was to, feed my pathological need to watch Formula One, no matter how boring the races are. Um, but now I look at um, my subscriptions, especially with my teenage daughter, and I realize I've got thousands of them. There's something that have come into the popular psyche that we understand, and we understand the value um, difference between perpetual and subscription, and each have their place. And sometimes um, it's just worth reinforcing the difference. Um, so if we look at typical on-premise solutions for managing network infrastructure, um, the perpetual licensing cost up front, then the ongoing cost as the iceberg underneath. Um, I'll not read out there. I think everyone that's ever you know managed an IT team or, or ran a network management pl uh, platform understands how those costs bear out and how they break down. When it comes to cloud and software as a service, the subscription fee, yes, the iceberg is larger above the water. However, underneath that, because the vendor is basically looking to design, build, run this for you and continuously improve it for you in the cost of the subscription fee, um, you see a different equation bear out potentially where we should see actual as a TCO over a model that cloud when it comes to network infrastructure and especially when we start unlocking, unlocking value around artificial intelligence, machine learning, the management of IoT and tying more tightly into security, um, those upfront costs um, are you know, part of a TCO much more preferable um, to the typical premise um, on-premise perpetual licensing model. So with that all said, um, what is it? What is cloud-driven networking? Um, so I'll keep this fairly, you know, high level in vanilla so we can go through it. I think cloud-driven networking really came from um, Wi-Fi, first of all, and first and foremost. So on the on the diagram, we can see some routers, some switches, and some wireless access points. Um, Wi-Fi, given its architectural um, designs over the last probably 15, 20 years, naturally leaned towards a management platform that could be anywhere. Um, and when the concepts of, okay, how do we manage these Wi-Fi access points from the cloud and keep them secure were, were overcome with technologies like you know, encryption, so our good friend certificates and SSL, um, to manage these access points. We could manage a disparate Wi-Fi network at scale, many thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Wi-Fi access points from a central place 
um, that was hosted somewhere else. And that was all very well and good. And the advantages started coming from the data we could collect from those Wi-Fi access points, um, the reporting, the analysis, and the management. The tougher nut to crack was how do we manage routers and switches from the cloud? Um, routing and switching with its complexity of multiple protocols, its complexity of perhaps a 20, 25 year design heritage based around no concept of the cloud whatsoever, meant it was much more difficult to start moving that management plane from on-prem to cloud. And tying those two things together is one of the imperatives of why we should be looking at new protocols, new topologies, new ways of designing our um, enterprise networks from a routing and switching point of view. Perhaps moving away from some of the legacy, which has served as well, but increasingly is adding complexity and slowing down our business and the agility that we're trying to achieve. And more pertinently, really stopping your migration of large scale campus organizations to the cloud. So with that at extreme, what we've been striving over the last three, three years is to take one of our technologies from our Wi-Fi and move it into the cloud, which is 100% successfully done. And recently um, looking at a technology which we call Fabric and moving that to the cloud as well which is also something we have successfully completed and done. And we now have our organizations, our customers, um, looking at their reporting analysis, management, troubleshooting, um, AI and ML from a cloud platform end-to-end um, -end across a campus infrastructure. So what does that look like? What sort of things can the cloud from a management platform give you? Um, so we've talked about that obvious things about keeping our single pane of glass, the centralized visibility. It gives us an incredible amount of data analytics and some of the slides in, in over the next couple, we can start showing out how much data we're collecting um, just on a daily basis. It gives us really easy, simple ways of doing unified configuration. It gives us really strong, simple ways of um, unifying our security and our access control uh, across um, both the network infrastructure and, in, and integrating to our firewalls via APIs and automation. Um, we look at what we're seeing um, in the campus and edge switching um, model. What we've done with fabrics and what we're doing with um, the security around fabrics is driving you know, via the cloud, a completely different paradigm of how organizations are structured and we'll cover those off as well. And data center and SD1, um, much more um, perhaps nascent to the entire cloud portfolio, but we believe we will see data center technologies and all SD1 technologies wrapping into the cloud um, very, very soon. So with that, what we always talk about with cloud-driven networking is availability, um, you know, driving, you know, 100% availability. I mean, our cloud platform hasn't had an outage in, I think it's over 18 months now. Um, we talk about flexibility, how you can deploy the cloud to manage your infrastructure. Um, uh, at Extreme, we have options around, you know, going complete our um, public cloud, running AWS, Google, or Azure, but you can also run this privately in your own private cloud, or you can even run your own local cloud if you wish. And we talk around security um, around this. Security, the advantages we can get from cloud network with security, especially around um, corporate governance and strong compliance, uh, which we have with our ISO 27001 certifications, which we push down to organizations through the use of our cloud is a, a, a significant benefit when it comes to looking at how you are posturing against security threats, um, what compliance is upon your own organizations, and you know those sorts of conversations you might be having with, with CISOs or with, with anyone in the organizations that's um, representing your security bodies. And look, we see this as, as three things really from an operational point of view. Every single cloud vendor should be trying to keep it simple um, with um, as near as damn it plug and play that you can connect your infrastructure to the cloud and manage it easily without significant up, uh, upfront investment and resource to make that happen. Um, cloud value, cloud as we've talked about is a subscription service. Um, I think last year, Extreme introduced something like 500 new features into our cloud platform in one year with no downtime. That's the value that the subscription gives um, from any cloud platform. You get ongoing new features built into the system turnkey when you log in. Um, and we will see that accelerating as we start unlocking 
um, ML and AI as cloud platforms get more mature, and we understand that. And the agile development, that continuous delivery um, that you get inside your organizations. Look, I'm just going to spend a few brief moments on uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, I think it's um, an incredibly interesting topic, but I think it's a, a topic that we can sometimes overestimate where we are right now. Um, and I think the key cornerstone that we're looking at is data. Um, we've talked around the digital economy for a heck of a long time. And we've seen phrases that, you know, get banded around, you know, um, data is the oil of the digital economy and so on. And that might be true, but we have to learn how to start using that data. Um, it's easy to collect it, but what does it mean? Um, so we have to organize it um, and present that, first of all, in an intuitive dashboard. Um, we need to organize the data so we can start selecting it and slicing it, that machine learnings with neural networks can start adding value. If we don't organize this huge amount of data properly, we are just basically doing the old adage of garbage in, garbage out, which is one we all wish to avoid. We have to learn and the systems have to learn to provide proactive insights. Um, for example, um, from the world of wireless, um, what we're doing in that is simple things, but simple things that make everyone's job easier. Um, for example, 10 clients connected to an access point, the access point is exhibiting poor behavior compared to your own access points plus all the other access points we're managing globally. However, we can see on this access point, there is a laptop um, running a, an operating system build and a firmware driver build that equals this known issue. We then feed back that that is almost certainly the problem. That sort of proactive insight um, that we, we can harness from the learned data globally. Then as we start getting more and more intelligence in this becomes an action where we can start really doing closed feedback loops around that sort of information. Closed feedback loops around security. These devices are behaving abnormally. We see this, uh, this abnormality as manifestation of a security threat. Do we remove these devices from the infrastructure and so on? That is where um, ML and AI is going to start taking us over the medium term. And just a, I guess a quick sneak peek when we say about machine learning and, and artificial intelligence. Um, this is a screen grab from um, our cloud platform. I just took it as you, it shows you this when you log out. Um, what we're managing um, actually delivers 30 petabytes of data a day. Um, I ran out of um, analogies for what a petabyte of data was. I was going to use DVDs and somebody pointed out to me that no one has a DVD player anymore. And I began to feel perhaps a little bit older than I should do. Um, but I found a metric of how much petabytes of data equals um, HD video. I, I guess I should turn it into Netflix streaming numbers. But one petabyte is 13 years of HD video. So we are processing informational events based upon 400 years of HD video daily. Um, and we collect 7.7 .7 billion management events from that daily that feed um, the, AI, uh, the AI and ML systems we're building around the cloud. So if we look at some of the use cases, and the use cases are, are absolutely king when it comes to machine learning and artificial intelligence where we are right now. There's basic set, um, which I think are table stakes for everyone. And I've given one around the, the Wi-Fi problems we can, we can see. Um, but, you know, it's talking around stability and capacity and efficiency, where algorithms from a system can easily spot um, challenges that can be rectified with some degree of simplicity. And we can give you, you know, a reduced risk and a rapid resolution um, towards uh, a more stable, more, you know, um, secure, more um, stable environment for your users um, to enjoy and use. What we start talking about advanced sets are things like hardware failure prediction is a really nice topic where we see, you know, um, perhaps switches or Wi-Fi or routers, their um, thermal temperature steadily increasing or we see um, fan speed steadily changing, or we see other um, components on there that are going to manifest themselves in potential failure within a prescribed period of time. We can then start doing actionable insights out of that, like auto RMA, where you as a customer receive another switch that says, we spotted this switch in this location was probably going to fail soon. 
please swap it for this one. And that gives a much more predictable um, way of managing your infrastructure. And that's the sort of technology we're talking around as we start driving more advanced sets um, from this technology platform. So I just want to spend a, a few brief moments just going around back to the, the topology side of things. Now that you know, perhaps we've explored a little bit more depth of what cloud management can bring, how can we start doing our topologies of our infrastructure a little bit differently? Um, you know, I can, uh, you know, full disclosure, I was a network engineer for many, many years. Um, um, the traditional networks, rigid and complex I designed, built those all day, every day for, for a number of years. Um, uh, love doing it, um, but I think even I, as, as a bit of a, a bit of a curmudgeon in this can see that those times have really passed. So what we're talking about when we're talking about fabric networks is a completely different approach and getting past that node by node configuration where our infrastructure is much more um, holistically managed from a top level where we start driving lots of things around end to end automation. Um, we talk about virtualizing our network services properly. Um, we have all virtualized many things on our, in our campus environments and in our technology stacks from servers to applications. And it's interesting to know that network virtualization really do, does still um, sit in the world of VLANs, which are a concept around broadcast control from the mid nineties. With a fabric based technology, and there are many out there, we we'll start talking about how do we virtualize our network and how do we virtualize services properly? both at layer two from a switching point of view and layer three from a routing point of view. How do we deal with um, the pesky multicast traffic and AV? How do we start building away from these protocols that were invented never really to scale to what we have built campus environments to? Um, I think it's fair to say that multicast, if it was redesigned from scratch, would look nothing like the protocol that it is today. And then, tipping our hat back to our old friend of security and zero trust. Uh, what do we do about multi-tenancy in some higher education in environments, but also around micro segmentation and keeping our traffic um, highly segregated. So what we talk around with, with fabric style networks is, you know, driving top line. How can I just get things done quicker and save money and make money? Um, we all eventually have to do that because we all report back to our customers at some point. And I'm guilty as charged on the services hop by hop box on the left, um, configuring each single box, typically from a CLI, um, is incredibly error prone. It is incredibly slow and it's incredibly complicated. Um, that is a way that we have inherited from the past, not saying it was the sins of our fathers, it was the best way of doing it at the time. However, are we now at a time where perhaps there's a much, much different way which is where to deploy services across an infrastructure, all we do is look at the two edge parts of our infrastructure, one part on one side of the network and another on another, and ask the service to be, prevent, be presented to those two ports on a network. It is a much faster, much more simple, and incredibly much more safe way of doing it. We talk about reducing the risk through effective segmentation. Um, with fabric infrastructures, what we can start looking at is creating zones instead of VLANs. Um, and these zones are basically fundamentally secure from each other until we make a decision to allow traffic to reverse between them. So if we looked at back at our, our good friend, the Zero uh, Trust, um, and you know the, the lateral movement threat, with fabric-based networking and the segmentations that it can deliver, um, we start carving out different um, parts of the network that simply cannot um, communicate with each other. The segmentation is at scale and is end to end, and um, it's completely stealthy. You cannot see anything in your network. Um, and that easy, simple way of just changing the paradigm that we see where in a typical infrastructure, we create a service, then have to secure it. In a fabric, we have we create a service, then we have to allow it to flow across our network. Is a complete 360, um, you know, different approach to tackling that challenge that we face um, every day. And then we talk about automation. Um, what we are seeing with fabric-based networking is 
a really different way of driving that service delivery across our entire infrastructures. We look at the network edge where we can connect users, devices, access points, cameras, um, and have the fabric infrastructure identify what that device is and automatically pull the service from the fabric to the access edge switch port. Um, we've recently used, done this on using our own fabric technology for a large healthcare customer. And the edge switches basically hold no real configuration. All they do is identify the device that's plugged into a switch port, request from the fabric, the service that should be presented to that device, and then that is their job done. When the device is disconnected, the service is repealed and goes away. That means our attack surface and attack vectors trying to exploit anything on, our, on this net type of networking is incredibly different from a traditional infrastructure. So our venture iteration of this platform is called Fabric Connect. Um, we've been deploying it for over 10 years in highly emission critical environments. Um, several universities in Australia use the platform, I'm delighted to say, um, but also many hundreds of universities globally. Um, one thing we were trying to do if we could have made it to Queensland and under third party validated the last point there, I try not to read points on screens, um, but it's the unbreachable in hackathon events. Um, what we do at um, such events as QuestNet is build a fabric network and ask anyone to freely try and hack between two services. Um, I'm so disappointed we couldn't offer um, that hackathon event at QuestNet this year. Um, to be fair, we do um, back ourselves. We give a $10,000 prize for anyone that can do it. Um, I'll perhaps disappoint a few people. It, it's never been done, um, but we'll quite gladly, um, if we're all able to travel again to QuestNet 22, um, I would love to be able to put that on and, and see how it fares um, uh, against um, some of the white hat and black hats that we may have uh, working in your organizations or there may be an attendance at, at QuestNet. So to briefly wrap up in my last few moments, um, you know, I just see this, and I think we're all beginning to, to see this from the customers and you know, I speak to on a daily basis that um, putting all these concepts together, um, we are approaching that point where it really is time to perhaps look at something a little bit different. What we have seen and what we have done already with cloud um, is phenomenal. And we're only just getting started. I think everyone knows that, um, that more and more workloads, more and more workflows, um, more and more compute storage and networking will end up in there uh, along with the management of our infrastructures end to end. Um, AI and ML, um, it's in its infancy, but that is going to massively alter um, the data sets and the value uh, infrastructure um, and all the technology platforms we invest in um, give back to us. Cybersecurity, we know this challenge is not going to go away. It has become much more severe um, and much more uh, prevalent uh, moving forward. You know, ransomware being one of them. But I think we all know we're living in a, a much more dangerous world on many levels. And cyber is one of those um, spaces that will can carry on being uh, attacked and exploited um, via many actors, both at state level and both and those that are um, working uh, in smaller groups. Um, look, and cybersecurity not going away. Like I think we all hope that our, our friend COVID is going to go away, um, but it shows no sign of abating. Um, put all those together, uh, and then we come back to what we talk around with digital transformation. I think everyone saw the meme that did the rounds. I think it first started on LinkedIn that, you know, how many of us have tried to digitally transform ourselves and our organizations and, and failed, but what it took was a one in a 100 year pandemic to do that. And I think there's some truth in that jest. There is many um, half truths in, in jokes like that. But what we are seeing now, put all that together, what we can do with digital transformation, the need that these challenges are presenting us with um, really should give us that impetus um, to have a look at some of the fundamentals we're doing in our infrastructure, especially when it comes to campus environments, switching routing Wi-Fi, and perhaps start looking at a um, different way of approaching those challenges as we move forward. Um, I, I said we're, we're platinum sponsors of the event and we're um, absolutely um, you know, privileged and pleased to hold that position. And 
Um, come along and visit our booth. Um, we're also here in spirit, so I think you can catch us on the virtual app as well. So um, on that note, I will wrap up um, a few moments early. I hope that was informative. And um, I say come along and have a chat with us and our representatives at the event. Have a chat with us on the app. And I very much look forward to um, hopefully seeing you all in person in the not too distant future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julian. Do you have a few minutes for questions? I sure do. I hope they come through loud and clear. Fantastic. I, I just want to say, uh, firstly, you got a, a good set of laughs. So uh, on your understand your single glass of pain. So I think we have a few network <laughs> managers in the house. They understand the pain of glass or the single pane of glass, which is a glass of pain. All right, does anybody have any questions? I'm sure you must. Do we have any of the universities in-house uh, that use extreme networks? No, interestingly. That's great. Um, Julian, I will say that I was um, fascinated to hear you mention zero trust architecture because it's certainly something that's come up over the last few days. Um, is that something you are working actively towards helping organisations build? Absolutely. Look, um, we have, and I think one of my colleagues presented just this morning on, on the fabric in depth, um, we work with closely with our, our systems integrator partners, but also directly ourselves. Um, and um, we have an incredibly knowledgeable um, engineering and systems engineering and consultative team. And we crave conversations to understand your challenges and how our approach may help. Um, that is the offer that is always there from extreme to anyone. We will always spend our time to assist you understanding your challenges and how we would look to address them working with you know your, your partner community that you do do business with already um, but also working inside the constraints of your organizations to drive more value for um, you and the engagements we have with higher education establishments in australia currently um, i think those organizations would would stand um, up and would say that um, whilst there is obviously a transactional nature to this we do treat our customers as partners um, we really do drive towards value, and this is about driving value for uh, any organization that chooses to work with Extreme over the long term. So if there is any requirement that we can assist with, um, we are always willing to have that conversation. Look, I said we would love to have had some conversations this week. Um, if they can be done digitally or when we are allowed to travel face to face, we would relish the opportunity and please never hesitate to reach out. And you've uh, certainly dropped a red flag to the bulls for next year. Um, I think we're going to see the ethical hackers here in force. Uh, you know, $10,000 is a lot for a university. I'm wondering how they go about uh, claiming that. Um, I think it's they, they, might, they may have to donate it or something like that. But um, really fascinating. I have a question on your $7.7 .7 billion billion data sets that you're processing. Is that a challenge to make sense of such a, a really large data set and, and deliver, you know, let's filter out the weeds because, you know, we know there's excessive amount of weeds that come in in network logs and how do you get to the, the data rich sources in that? You're, you're absolutely right. Um, and in that pyramid we should have put up was the first thing about was really filtering, understanding, collating, driving towards things that are of value. Um, and there's, there's, a, there's the challenge of scale. Um, we collect that data and currently we collect that data and we collect every day's data and we never throw any of it away. We keep every single piece of data. So 7.7 .7 billion a day, we do not ever roll that around. So it's really, I'm terrible at maths. I'm not even going to try and work out how many that is a year, uh, but it's a heck of a lot. So yes that is what our r d is all going around striving to drive the richness out of that the commonalities um feeding that through then um networks um at ai and ml level that can make sense of that richness and start driving towards that value and that is why you know i think with all genuineness we are all at that basics set right now and the interesting challenge is going to be is who really cracks that advanced set first and 
having the data at hand is going to be key of that, but it's only a part of that. So it is an interesting challenge that the world, not just data networking um, organizations is, is challenged with, and it will be interesting how quickly we can accelerate, accelerate from basic to advanced. Um, um, I, my fervent hope is it's you know, 12 to 24 months, uh, hopefully sooner. Okay, one last call to my uh, very quiet audience here. Does anyone want to ask Julian a question? Anything burning? I think, Julian, that they are very hungry and ready for lunch. So uh, with that, I will thank you very much for your presentation. Everybody, please thank Julian. <laughs>